thank you so much, Secretary Crisco, Maureen. I think you've given, given us a real good sense for, frankly, how this all connects, how we're connecting our education, and I love what you said about being a fanatic. Secretary Crisco, how that all, just the fanaticism around education, bringing that intensity back, um, what it all means, frankly, for us as, as business leaders, and then connecting that uh, to economic development and the work that's being done in our community colleges. Uh, some of that was just mind-boggling to me when I saw uh, all that equipment, and someone actually has to put some energy and time and thought and intellect into creating that. And it's our children, our young people, who are actually doing that. So we're going to give our panel an opportunity to respond to what you heard with these two wonderful uh, presenters. And then to take it wherever you want to go. This is going to be a conversation, dialogue, debate, <coughs> stir it up. And if you don't stir it up, we'll stir it up. Right, Luke? There you go. All right. You want to just open it up, or you got something to say? Don't just let me do all the talk. Well, no, I running. think uh, just to dovetail the last set of remarks, and that one of the fun parts of my job is I get a chance to travel the state, and I've been to a lot of the places you saw on the map there. And you know, I, I, it's so frustrating because you read a lot in the press today about we don't make things in America anymore. We make a lot of things in America. We make a lot of things in North Carolina. As Keith knows, we're the fifth largest manufacturing state in the country. In fact, I remember asking uh, Scott's. Uh, predecessor at his job, what, what's the worst thing that could happen in North Carolina? And he, without batting an eyelash, he said, we can stop making things. Mm -hmm. So we're busy making things, and the important part, is, I mean, this is a good problem to have. I mean, you know, it's a good problem to have that we're busy growing the economy making things because it keeps bringing companies here. Uh, now the challenge we have is to fill that skills gap. Those are good problems to have. So we'll let our panel react. I'm kind of dovetailing on what you words intensity, intensity and fanaticism. Um, it seems to me that we do need this huge paradigm shift in the state of North Carolina. That those, uh, the classroom uh, videos were just very compelling. So, and the folks in, this, in, in the group today, I think we're, we're, we're on board with that. But how do, we, how do we get the general public, other businesses, to really understand this, this <coughs> paradigm shift, this feeling of intensity that we need to transform education in the state of North Carolina now? What can the Chamber do, the Department of Commerce do? How do we get, I'm, you know, I represent engineering firms. I think there's another gentleman in the audience that does as well, but that's about it. You know, how do we, our sector, how do we get people engaged and realize that, that now is the time and we've got to do this? And I just throw that out to, to you, perhaps the, uh, the secretary. Well, I think in general, Businesses do understand. They understand the importance. You talked to even the examples that Marie brought up. Uh, I love the example of Siemens. And when they made the announcement of the, of the jobs there in Mecklenburg County, it was the largest manufacturing announcement since 1979. And then it was like 879, I think was the number. And then we talked to the manager. And I asked the question if this plant came to North Carolina way back. I picked the number arbitrarily, uh, 1995. Well, I remember 1995. That wasn't that long ago. How many people would you employ in this plant for the same output? And the number I was given was in and around 1,500. That shows you the new skills right there, the new automation, the new new way they're doing. Over a 15, basically a, a 10, around a 15-year period that they advanced that much. That. That, that is a measure of the skills we need. And that company really understands that. Uh, I think the issue is translating that understanding somehow into our educational our public schools. Uh, that's a public question. I, I don't think it's an understanding or a priority need gap. There is a how do we translate it into the classroom gap uh, or perceived gap. And that, that, that's more focused, I think, our challenge. Uh, the business community in general will help. So, yes. And just to add to that, I, I think also there's a lot of opportunity for business to become engaged with the public schools and get back in the classrooms. I mean, the, the type of instruction that Sophie was illustrating 
it is a great opportunity for you know you as an engineering firm to be back in the classroom talking about real world applications and not just in public schools but in community colleges and universities as well. So I have to start off by saying a disconnected point but very connected. I thought it was interesting that your firm is putting $250 million into dropout prevention. I think it's interesting we talk about workforce and people coming to work. And then we talk about <coughs> training in the community college. And right in the middle of that is what happens in North Carolina is 25% of children that are dropping out. How, much, how effective are they going to be in the workforce? And how much additional demand is it put on the community college to have to respond to that group? Now, I, don't want to, I don't want to comment on that because I want to respond this way. Well, I want to comment this way. I think we're spending a terrible lot of money at the community college system for remedial efforts. And I know Scott will comment on it later. If we could solve that problem in the public schools, then we would have a lot more resources to put into our efforts to train and develop a higher level of workforce. I think that's a real challenge inside this discussion today is what, how do we address that issue as a potential workforce issue. I want to move it over to the side because I don't think any of us prepared for that debate. The real point I wanted to raise with uh, both the speakers, we mentioned the word global and we identified companies who are truly global manufacturers. To what extent are we engaging those global business leaders in our education system to translate global into real for the classroom? I can start by just saying that um, certainly the three illustrations that we gave today, all three of those leaders are engaged with the local community college on, on, on a very um, personal basis. They serve on advisory boards to, to specific curriculum programs. They are donating equipment to our community colleges. And I know Scott can speak on the lack of equipment funds that we have within community colleges, but um, they, they are engaged and they, they recognize that community colleges are going to be the venue from which they are able to, to glean that pipeline. Those are excellent examples in my opinion, and it's wonderful, very good point, that's not enough, it's not quick enough. We've also we've got to get the uh, management of a and &E thread and people who are existing in North Carolina countries who have realized that globalization is their market and not just the ones we bring in that are global, but the ones that are here that have miraculously discovered they can sell stuff overseas and they become more global to survive, get them involved. And I know many examples where they are. That, that's, that's more mass of, of companies and we need to get those tapped with those also. Well, and again, a real life example right now, uh, in the short session, we're actually going to move legislation to facilitate lateral entry. So right here, in the Research Triangle Park, you have companies like GlaxoSmithKline that have smart scientists that want to be teaching in schools. You can't do it. It's easier to send them around the world to somewhere else than to do it right here. So actually, with your help, we might get that legislation passed and put smart people to work in our schools because they want to do it right now. Yeah. One thing I think that's important when thinking about workforce development, there are two different, in my mind, two different elements that are different but uh, and are important. One is, and you saw this somewhat in Maureen's presentation, is workforce training. Now, workforce training is primarily, in my opinion, for adults, or more likely for adults, who want a job tomorrow. That's their focus. They want a job tomorrow. But there's a, a very important, if not more important, piece of workforce development, which I really think this conversation is more about, which is workforce preparation. That's really more for youth, who are not necessarily looking for a job tomorrow, but a meaningful career for a lifetime. Now the challenge can be is that when you're working with youth in that environment, the one-to-one -one linkage is not as, as strong. And I think that's one of the things we have to think about when we think about theme schools and we think about, I mean, you saw the, the, the presentation of the, the student who attends the Wake, you know, it's a Wake Tech early college the health academy right beside Wade um, Ned. But he's going into political science, it, but that's what happens, you know? And that's one of the things I saw and learned from experience. We, when I was at Crazy Community College, we, we started what I thought was one of the first STEM, very applied STEM high school 
early college in North Carolina, but I learned very quickly that students don't make decisions about specific jobs when they're ninth and 10th grade. But the best you can hope for is to gravitate towards areas that may not have otherwise thought about it. Sometimes that gravitation, you're not going to just walk right across the street to an industry. But that, that gravitation, I think, is very, very important. And it may not be as one-to-one -one direct, but for the long term for North Carolina, it's even more important. We saw that, Martin pointed out, there's a mismatch that's going on right now. Part of that mismatch is because to few of our students don't study hard enough. And they don't get far enough along in school and there's not as much opportunity, nearly much about being now, if we're dropping out or getting beyond high school than there was 50 years ago. There's also a mismatch we don't talk about quite as much and it's a little bit of a bugaboo, it's a challenge. But you know, when students go to college, twice as many students now enroll in, in humanities, social science, and business than they do in engineering, technology, healthcare, and science put together. Now, there's nothing wrong with humanity, social science, and business. There's just not nearly as many jobs in those areas. That's the challenge, and that's a bugaboo we don't talk about quite as much. And how we kind of confront those issues about having to be more rigor, and I think we need more academic rigor in our technical program, but a lot more contextualization in our general programs. And I think that's a, a challenge for us to think long term about how these things come together. But we cannot shortchange the importance of the workforce preparation part. <coughs> We did get a lot of good stuff to do. Thanks, Dr. Rawls. Uh, Andrea. Yeah, before, as, as Scott's walking out, you know, I think that um, you know, our children are what they see. You know, I think that this organization out here called the 100 Black Men, and a part of what they say in their thing is that uh, we are what we see. And so as we talk about workforce development and workforce preparation, and I think I'm old enough, um, part of uh, that silver tsunami generation that, that Jim Johnson talked about, that remembers when the, the workforce development program also had a youth component. So that young people during the summer months and during the school year, particularly low to moderate income kids, could have uh, some work experience. So they could see that there were other opportunities out here other than simply um, uh, maybe just working in fast foods or whatever else they saw in that um, economy we want to talk about that exists in poor communities. And I think we've gotten away from that. I think to some extent sometimes we have well-intentioned but ill-informed public policies. So that much of the money that was going towards helping these young people have a different level of exposure where they could also learn while they were in those work settings and also build their academic skills at the same time, we moved all that money away from those programs and put that also in the community college system. So I think that somewhere down the line, you know, we have to kind of check ourselves in terms of what we're really doing. I listened to, to uh, Secretary Crisco talk about what happened when he was in school. And so when you look too at, you know, this whole notion of uh, I am what I see. So I say for a lot of the young people who are dropping out or who are not prepared, what do they see? And for lots of people in North Carolina who look like me, um, we don't see much who looks like us. And that's fact, so we have another problem. And, and these kinds of challenges aren't necessarily the challenges we want to talk about. So we're gonna talk about, you know, a new school and what does that really look like? And in some respects, in my community, when, you know, this whole new school concept kind of reminds me of an old argument that we in the African American community had uh, two, three hundred years, two hundred years ago between W.E.B. and Booker T. I mean, so, you know, and we need both. Um, so, and so those of you who don't know that, ask the people that are shaking their heads what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I know all about it. <laughs> that's right, that's right. So, Kind of an old, old argument. So I think that um, you know, I would say that that you know we that today in, a, in the newspaper there's an article that says and I'm sure Billy Ram surprised he didn't say it um, that says that North Carolina has the second largest rural population in the country um, behind Texas and ahead of Pennsylvania. And if you look at what you know how jobs have changed in these rural communities, then what is it that young people see in these rural communities? 
Uh, and what is it that, um, you know, I say to people, Billy Ray put me on a panel, and I'm gonna shut up in a second. He put me on a panel to say, to talk about young people coming back to rural communities. And I told him when he put me on the panel, he didn't know what he was doing. <laughs> um, and so uh, they asked me, you know, what would I say about the young people about coming back to rural communities? So if you're coming back to communities like mine, don't come. You know, if you are, if you do what we say to do, if you go to college and you gain a skill, don't come back to my community. Because the job you can get in my area is the same job if you look like me, you could have gotten if you graduated from high school. So it's another piece of, you know, and so I think that part of what we have to do is we gotta really be serious about all the change that needs to happen and all the real conversations that need to happen. But then at the same time, if we want to talk about how we need to value other skills, whether the construction skills or engineering, we gotta also change what kids see. We gotta do our own marketing campaign and PR campaign to start to lift them, lift these other occupations and opportunities so that they can see that they are valuable and they can see that they can make a living, you know, being a plumber, just showing up at somebody's front door before you even say the thing. Um, so I think it's part of what do our kids see, and they are what they see. Absolutely, wonderful point. In fact, I'm, when we close up, I think we just have about two minutes left, and I want to actually hit something that you talked about. Let's uh, let's go to Steve, and then Jeff, and then we'll wrap this time up. Thank you, Andrew. This, this, this is a question uh, and a point, uh, but the question part is really for Maureen and, and, and Keith. I uh, read an article in the Wall Street Journal a few months ago and they referenced the study, which uh, I'll preface by saying I don't think uh, fits uh, two of the companies that we have here today in Progress Energy and AT&T, but the study referenced uh, the fact that uh, say over the last 10 or so years that companies themselves were putting less resources into internal training and workforce development within their own companies and that they were trending towards uh, relying more on the public sector or educational system or community colleges to provide uh, that training and that workforce development. And uh, of course we're all talking about partnerships and uh, more collaboration and interaction which we know is very, very important. But my question to you, Maureen Keith, uh, in terms of uh, what you have seen in your experiences on the workforce development part and working with a number of companies, is that trend, do you see that trend with uh, North Carolina companies? Uh, and is that uh, something that we need to work with them on? Well, I'll, I'll start and then certainly turn it over to uh, Secretary Crisco. But I read that same article and, and I think companies have to realize that, you know, their specific processes are unique and specific to them. And they have to take ownership in training just as we are preparing a workforce, but education is a education and training is a continued process. It is a lifelong learning process. And until companies can really embrace that, you know, I, I think that they are failing themselves. Now, what I will say is that in North Carolina, um, you know, I, I think companies are committed to training. It's unfortunate that sometimes when there are production schedules to be met and you are trying to compete globally and you are trying to get a product out the door, that training can be put you know, on the back burner, if you will. But I think most of the companies in North Carolina that we deal with recognize the value of that lifelong learning concept. Thing. But they too have got to take ownership. It doesn't just stop once they hire someone. See, I think it's pretty hard to generalize in North Carolina firms. I, I do see some that are still training, but I still recommend it done in, in a real kind of negative uh, or perhaps understandable discussion I've gotten into as our as our workforce is more mobile, if the model uh, in, in certain industries are quite mobile. People go from company to company. Uh, the the, the you know, certain training, not 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 all training, but certain training, that the company feel like they just can't afford to put the investment yeah. across. Yeah. Just think you put two years into a training curve and and employee will be three years. If company employees will be with you forty years. That's another. Kind of investment return model. 
So that, that's in there somewhere. I, I, I can't deny we have those kind of attitudes and discussions. It's perhaps somewhat understandable from, from a pure regulatory standpoint. <coughs> but again, certain companies, certain models, do are, in, are trained quite well today, but it's not as prevalent as it was 20 years ago. I agree. Because of some of the change in our workforce, change in the mobility of our workforce, change in the profile of the kind of companies we have in North Carolina. Uh, the more traditional companies that had operations that stayed the same for a while, you could invest in training and then you get your return. And so those, those are some of the factors we're thinking about. So, I have close just one